VOR navigation is outdated, useless, and the FAA should remove it from the practical test. You've likely heard that from others and maybe even said it yourself. Considering the prevalence of GPS in the modern cockpit, it seems like a reasonable statement. However, the truth is that while GPS is widely used, the FAA still requires us to understand VOR navigation because it provides an additional layer of knowledge, reliability, and redundancy. Today, we'll explore five basic concepts to make sure that even if you don't rely on it much, you can successfully navigate using VOR. I've picked these five topics because I've seen them trip students up on lessons, stage checks, and even check rides. So let's get started. Imagine you're on a training flight near Southeast Iowa Regional Airport, KBRL. You've just completed practicing unusual attitude recoveries and your instructor turns to you and says, okay, now take me direct to the Burlington VOR. What do you do? The first step should be to take out your sectional and look for the compass rose. Once you find it, somewhere within that circle should be the information box, and that box will contain the name of the station, the frequency, the station identifier, and other information depending on the type of nav aid. In this case, the frequency is 111.4 and the identifier is BRL. Alternately, if you're using ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot, you can use their search functions. If you know the three-letter identifier, that makes finding the station simple. If you don't, typing in the full name will also bring up the list. Just make sure you select the correct result. In this case, the Burlington VOR DME. Also, in ForeFlight, you can use the nearby function. Even if GPS functionality isn't working, press and hold where you think you are on the sectional. A window will come up showing several pieces of information. At the bottom of the window is a list of nearby items. If you select nav aids, it will list the nearest ground-based navigation aids. The second step is to enter the frequency into the navigation radio. There are several ways to accomplish this depending on the equipment in your aircraft, so, so we won't spend time on it. However, I will mention that in a busy cockpit, it can be easy to hit the wrong button or to turn the dial not enough or just a little too much. So, once you believe you've entered the frequency, double check it by reading it out loud from the chart or other source, then reading it out loud from the frequency you just entered into the radio. If they don't match, fix the radio. In most aircraft with newer avionics, you have the ability to load in two frequencies into each navigation radio. This means we need to make sure we're using the right frequency. Therefore, the third step is making sure the frequency you want is the active frequency. In most cases, the frequency is entered in the standby position and then you need to hit the swap button to move it to the active or use frequency. The positions will either be labeled like this Bendix King radio or they'll be different colors like this Garmin 430 where white is active and blue is standby. However your avionics identifies the active frequency, double check to make sure the desired frequency is active. Again, I recommend touching the radio and verifying this out loud. I say something like 111.4 is in the active position. The extra step of looking, touching the radio, then speaking makes it less likely that you'll make a mistake. The fourth step is to positively identify the frequency. The AIM 1-1-3 Section C notes that the only positive method of identifying a VOR is by its Morse code identification or by the recorded automatic voice identification. While verifying after double checking sounds redundant, it does serve two purposes. First, it's another way to ensure that you've entered the right frequency. Second, it allows you to ensure the station is actually working. If you don't hear the Morse code or verbal recording, you've either entered the wrong frequency or the station is down. The fifth and final step involves what my instructor used to call the $150 button. He used to call it that because not using this button appropriately will result in a checkride failure. And his estimation of how much it would cost to redo that portion of the checkride was, well, you guessed it, $150. This step is simple but critical, and it's also easy to forget. If your aircraft has GPS and VOR equipment installed, you likely have a button or switch to select the one connected to the CDI. Use that button to ensure VOR or VLOC is selected as the navigation source. So there you go. In summary, the five steps are find the frequency, enter the frequency, activate the frequency, verify the frequency, then select VOR using the CDI button. But how to remember them? Well, for grins and giggles, I asked ChatGPT for suggestions on a mnemonic, and my favorite was, flying elephants always visit Seattle. <laughs> but just in case that doesn't work for you, another that seemed more related to aviation was fly early, avoid vexing surprises. So, to make sure you're set up correctly for VOR navigation, remember to fly early, avoid vexing surprises. 
If you like this video, please consider a donation through Buy Me A Coffee. The link is in the description below, and as a thank you, I'll provide a link to be able to download the script for this video, including pictures and graphics. Also, please comment, hit the thumbs up, and consider subscribing. Finally, there is more to VOR navigation. For more information, I'd recommend watching this video next. As always, thank you for watching, fly safely, and I will see you next time.